Hello and welcome to Ash. This is uh, my celebration of one of the nation's most common uh, broadleaf trees that is now under serious threat from ash dieback disease. Um, some three or four years ago I was becoming increasingly concerned at the fact that uh, nobody was producing a publication to celebrate the tree um, and I could see a scenario much like Dutch elm disease developing where one day we turn around and we look and say what did the world look like with beautiful big ash trees in it? So I set out to produce this book. Uh, my publishers weren't particularly interested at the time um, so I was fortunate enough to get funding from the Woodland Trust and the Association of AONBs and they made it possible for me to produce this book. It was a long journey um, but I'm very pleased with the outcome and I hope you will enjoy this show which is a toe in the water to give you an idea of how splendid and beautiful this tree really is. Um, I think uh, it will be a lasting legacy and I can only hope that in 10 to 20 years time we still have some ash trees left. This is um, what I like to think of an archetypal situation of ash trees growing in their true heart, one of their true heartlands. This is in the Derbyshire Dales, two beautiful ash trees in the early morning in May in um, at the end of Dovedale. Uh, I think you'll agree these are very splendid specimens and um, it gives you an idea of what we stand to lose I suppose in the landscape. It was um, the Reverend Gilpin, a writer and coiner of the phrase picturesque, who at the end of the 18th century described the ash tree as the Venus of the woods. And I think this autumnal picture, which shows the beautiful filigree profile of uh, an ash tree growing in Borrowdale in Cumbria, um, really does show the grace and beauty of this quite remarkable tree. And I think we'll move first to some of the defining elements of the ash tree. Ash leaves are pinnate compound leaves, usually comprised of six to 12 paired elliptic ovate shallowly toothed leaflets. Um, usually a single terminal leaflet, but sometimes these can be paired as well. And the leaf profile varies um, quite a lot. Uh, sometimes these leaves are highly elliptical, uh, sometimes you'll find a uh, single leaflet at the end that is bifurcated, this is quite unusual. Sometimes the shape of the leaf is quite broad and doesn't really look like uh, an ash at all. This is the typical bark of an ash tree. As you can see, it's grey and uh, furrowed, um, much rougher in texture than it is on the young trees. Um, it's said that the ash name comes from either the grey colour of the bark or it's traditionally thought to be derived from the Old Norse word ask, which was the name for a spear because ash wood was popularly used in weaponry for making spears in the old days. Ash is a strange beast. It has male flowers and it has female flowers, sometimes on separate trees, sometimes on the same trees. It may also have hermaphrodite flowers. And weirdly, the ash can actually change its sex, which is a phenomenon that's not clearly understood at the moment. And the Samaras, which are the fruiting bodies which contain the seeds, will be formed uh, in the autumn and they are often seen as little brown bunches on the trees because the seeds need two years to germinate, so the tree sometimes holds on to them. The annual rings of ash, probably better than almost any other broadleaf tree, are very clearly defined and they show the effects of climatic conditions, of perhaps disease or management, 
and the effects that it will have on the ring width. Now you can see here, if you look about halfway across the uh, span, two very narrow lines, and those indicate the drought years of 1976-77. Look a little further outwards and you see a very broad ring, that's 1985, which was a particularly wet year, so lots of growth there. At the end of the, uh, at the outer edge of the tree, you'll see quite a lot of narrow rings closely together. And that indicates that the tree was probably under a good deal of stress. And it's symptomatic of the sort of ring patterns that we see in trees that are being attacked by ash dieback. So um, bearing in mind this was felled in 2010, it was a few years before um, we actually knew about ash dieback. Here we have a very healthy looking ash wood in Dorset with a nice mix of naturally occurring ash, uh, coppice regrowth, planted trees. So that's what a good healthy ash wood can look like. Uh, move up to the heartland of ash in Derbyshire and this is a typical country lane with uh, ash and perhaps the occasional sycamore growing along these lanes. A lot of young trees here, so these actually might be quite susceptible to ash dieback in the future. Um, it's very much a feature of Derbyshire on, uh, on the roads, along the wall, the old limestone walls and the hedge banks, lots of ash. And uh, if you look uh, around you, you'll see lots of beautiful, large, open-grown ash trees. Um, this makes you realise quite what a, a, a dramatic statement they are in the landscape and they will be hard lost. And further north in Northumberland, uh, here's one of the famous ash roads near Rothbury. Um, and uh, you can see again, this is all ash, uh, as far as you can see for a mile or two along this road, uh, really quite splendid. And uh, in the south uh, in um, Wiltshire, this is yet another ash road. And uh, again, it shows you, um, you know, what a different kind of ash road can look like. And these again will be a great loss to the landscape. And uh, these sort of tree-lined roads are going to become um, something of an issue for um, a lot of people in the, in the coming years because uh, what we've got going on here is um, a situation where trees will die, trees will become unsafe, unsteady. Um, we can't risk them falling on people, falling on the roads. So um, there will be a great expense incurred actually managing these areas and there will have to be a lot of tree felling. Um, I suppose the upside is there's an awful lot of ash wood for people to burn in their log burners, but um, it's still going to be um, a great sadness to see these features go from the landscape. And um, it's not just in rural areas, but also uh, in um, urban areas as well. Um, there are quite a lot of ash trees growing in streets and parks and gardens and uh, there are even more people concerned in terms of health and safety here and we'll see, you know, where there is a lot of traffic and there's a lot of houses um, there's going to have to be a very, very um, a strict regime of uh, looking after these trees Here's an ash tree that's already showing signs of thinning out and possibly becoming diseased. Um, this is typical of what you might see of an ash tree uh, trying to pull in its horns, trying to, trying to battle with ash dieback and the usual pom-pom effects on the boughs. If you want to see the typical symptoms, there are things like browning leaves which turn to black. On the stems, you look out for these diamond lesions, um, but more often I've found necroses that look like this, sort of brown, purple dieback coming down the stem. And uh, of course, if you really search the ground, look on the floor or leaf stems, the reiki, and you look for these um, little fruiting bodies of the fungus, which disperse millions and millions of these tiny ascospores. So uh, what do um, 
whole woods look like when they've been struck by ash dieback. Um, this is Ashwellthorpe in Norfolk, which is actually the first woodland where ash dieback was notified in the wild. Previously, um, uh, up until 2012, um, the disease had only been seen in nursery stock, uh, which had been imported from Northern Europe. And uh, we think there was uh, two ways that actually ash dieback arrived in this country. One was from this diseased uh, uh, stock of young plants, but also there may have been windblown spores that came over from Europe. Anyway, um, as you can see, the ash in this wood has been absolutely decimated. And um, quite a lot of uh, woods up and down the country now, like uh, this one in Kent, are starting to look like the aftermath of Dutch elm disease. Um, it's really very sad and um, there is no way back. Um, the uh, pathogen uh, Hymenus skyfirst fraxineer um, actually uh, gets into the trees and will um, uh, produce a chemical called viridiol which um, attacks the um, uh, nutrient and water bearing vessels uh, of the tree and that's why you get the dieback coming in the top of the tree um, and you can see it's inevitable once it's in there the vast majority of trees will die although um, there is something of a ray of hope on the horizon tests are currently being done to see if um, uh, by trialing uh, so-called tolerant ash trees they can perhaps uh, attain a stock of uh, seed which will have tolerance to the disease. So it's a fingers crossed time very much. Anyway, enough of the uh, doom and despair. Um, we're here really for uh, a celebration of the ash tree and there's nowhere better to see ash than in the Derbyshire Dales. We've already been to Derbyshire and um, I make uh, no apologies for coming back again. This is Dovedale in the early morning. Uh, look at that canopy. That is uh, not exclusively, but the majority of those trees are ash trees. And uh, while we're still in Derbyshire, we move to Lathkill Dale, which is not quite as well known and well visited as, as Dovedale. You can see the limestone outcrops there. You can see why ash likes it there. Ash uh, does very well on calcareous soils. Um, but you can see this view and uh, just imagine how it might look in 20 years time. Um, I have to report that um, much against um, uh, what I'm sure a lot of you would like to hear, uh, sycamore may well be the tree that uh, takes over where ash leaves off. Here are the various views of Lathkildale. In the southwest, another hot spot for ash uh, are the Mendips in Somerset. Here you see this view looking out across the Somerset levels. Uh, you can see lots of ash in the foreground doing very nicely, thank you. Um, and uh, when you get inside the woods, uh, here you find the most beautiful old coppice stools, many of which um, have just been abandoned really. I don't think the woods have been coppiced for a long time. But you can see how these were once really important working wood. So this is something of our cultural, uh, historical, economic, if you like, uh, heritage that's uh, buried within these woods. And uh, we don't yet know with some of these oldest ash trees how they're going to get on with ash dieback. Um, most trees that seem to be um, the most susceptible are the sort of up to about 50 year old trees. Um, although uh, regrowth from old coppice stools and pollards does seem susceptible too. Um, if we go up to the north of England, uh, Yorkshire is, um, has landscapes that are very much moulded by ash. Um, this is Malham Cove. You can see early in the morning um, most of uh, that tree cover in the bottom of the cove is ash. There's a bit of sycamore in there as well. Um, and um, again, you know, landscapes like this um, could be incredibly bereft. Uh, move up onto the top of the cove and you see how tenacious uh, ash can be. Here it is growing in the grikes of the limestone, almost bonsai proportions. Um, 
but the sheep can't get it and it's protected from the worst of the elements so ash is a tough little thing it does very well up here uh, move a little further into Ribblesdale and you find um, this remarkable place at Colt Park which is a national nature reserve you can see this is before the trees have uh, flushed and there's lots of wonderful ground flora going on here and again because it's raised limestone pavement the sheep can't find their way in here to predate either the trees or the plants um, this is up on the top of Ribblesdale um, how amazing is this? This tree has survived here. It's managed to grow into a mature tree despite all the odds. Um, in Scotland, this is Brer Achan uh, up in the Highlands and you can see this is a lone broadleaf tree in a very wild windswept landscape. Probably once served this deserted croft uh, with its timber. So, uh, you know, again, a landmark tree for people. Let's have a look at some of the things that grow on ash. Um, lichens, for example. I'm using this picture to start off with because it's a remarkable uh, ash tree uh, up in the Dundonnell estate up in northwest Scotland. Um, the strange burr on the boughs is completely uh, uh, unknown, but it has been found through a survey that this one tree has 33 different species of lichen quite amazing. Um, you normally think most lichens are associated with clean air and this pulmonaria on this ash tree in West Wales above the fluid is typical um, but some uh, lichens do actually like quite polluted atmosphere and uh, this one Xanthoria paritina is typical a lot of people have seen that and uh, many bryophytes grow on ash um, and I would have to say that uh, not all of these are mutually exclusive to ash, they will grow on other species, but they like the um, low acidity bark. Uh, this is of course uh, fungi, this is uh, King Alfred's bonds, and this is um, bacterial ash canker, which makes a terrible mess of the trees, but amazingly doesn't seem to kill them. Um, and then, of course, we do have galls which appear. These are uh, little cauliflower galls that appear on ash. They don't harm the tree in the long term. And um, quite unusual and rare is uh, mistletoe in ash. Uh, until I really started looking, I'd never associated it with ash, but um, it will grow. Um, you won't see it often, so look out for it. Ash appears in many different types of landscapes and uh, this is one in particular which is now increasingly rare. Uh, this is wood pasture in North Herefordshire and uh, uh, I was lucky enough to visit this uh, a couple of years ago and you can see here it is in open farmland which is most unusual. We normally associate wood pasture with the grounds around um, large estates um, and uh, so these trees are probably quite small but probably still 150, 200 years old and have been regularly managed. Um, it's, uh, I wouldn't say unique, but it's a very unusual uh, landscape and ha should be treasured. I mean, they, these really should be um, preserved uh, landscapes. They're quite, they're historic and of huge value and have some quite amazing trees in them. Uh, I found uh, this one, which I called the snail tree. I think you can understand why. And then there was this quite remarkable tree, balancing, a balletic tree. I call it the dancing tree. Again, it really is quite something. On the way home from the previous site, we stumbled upon this site at a place called Weil. Um, you can see here we have more trees. Uh, that look absolutely beautiful in a um, uh, wood pasture setting. Uh, they've clearly been regularly uh, pollarded and we actually ended up talking to the farmer to discuss um, what his plans were. He was naturally enough very worried about the uh, arrival of ash dieback and realises that he has a, a very special historic landscape here. So it's still grazed, it's still managed and cut on a regular basis. Um, we will have to hope that the um, cutting, uh, rather the new regrowth on the pollards doesn't become susceptible to ash dieback. 
and uh, it's good, good to know that people are aware and uh, looking out for these things. Probably the best way around this at the moment is if signs of ash dieback actually come to these trees to cut out any diseased material uh, and hopefully you can catch it before it's worked its way down into the body of the tree. Um, there was a very special place that uh, I found down in the West Country, Clapton Court down in Somerset has probably the oldest and largest uh, ash tree. Uh, again, probably this was once wood pasture around a big house. Um, and it is a, an absolutely massive tree. Some people have said it could be um, as old as seven or 800 years, which is really pushing the boat out for an ash. An old ash is generally considered to be um, around 250 to 300 years old. They, they just don't last as long as oaks. Um, but you can see this is a marvellous old beast and it's become like a, a family pet, a family friend. They look out for it and uh, we will hope that this one doesn't succumb to ash dieback. Um, really something quite special. But there are other beautiful old pollards just out in the open. This is one in Shropshire um, that's doing very nicely. Uh, if you actually get a closer look at it you'll see that it's really quite a beast of a tree. They can grow in amazing shapes. It's pretty well hollow. Um, you can't see the hollow side of it, but you can see underneath it, but what a beast. And then in the uh, hedgerows in uh, Devon, this is, this is near um, Hydrock. Um, it's hard to tell whether this is an old copy stool or an old pollard, but um, a real beast of a tree. And you can see um, how it's uh, really become part of a hedge in actual fact. And um, that's another important thing. Ash has always been a, a very important hedging tree because it's incredibly biddable. You can cut it and bend it and plash it. And you can see this is um, a Dorset hedgerow and probably hasn't been managed for, ooh, I don't know, at least 50 years, I'd say, maybe 100. Uh, but you could see where it was once laid into a hedgerow. And there are often monster trees to be discovered. Look around you and who knows what you may find. A group of people restoring an old bit of parkland down in Corn Cornwall on the edge of Falmouth found this massive coppice stool, 13.7 metres around. How old could this be? Nobody really can tell, but it is quite a beautiful thing. And we do have a few historic trees, not as many as oaks. Uh, this pile of gravestones may give you a bit of a clue. It's actually um, a tree in London, in St Pancras Old Church. And it's, uh, it's known as the Hardy tree because uh, Thomas Hardy was working for the engineers who uh, took the line out of St Pancras in 1866. And the young uh, Thomas Hardy was charged with the job of overseeing the movement or the exhumation of graves. And he piled these gravestones up, uh, meaning them to follow the corpses to their new burial place, but they never did. Um, and it's become something of a, a celebrity tree and a London, North London landmark. So really rather, rather fine. And if we actually look in historic documents, we can find uh, evidence of actually what was going on. Here is the Illustrated London News from 1866 and it shows the graves being dug up and there's the church in the background. Um, so that's a, a rather nice little add-on. The weeping ash is actually a sport uh, of the common ash and was first discovered in the middle of a field in Cambridgeshire in the mid 18th century. And it's uh, quite possible that every weeping ash that you will see is derived from that one original tree. This is Chatsworth and this tree has quite a colourful history, although not many people will realise it as they pass by it in, to see the treasures in Chatsworth. It was bought from a nursery by the Duke of Devonshire in 1830 and transported on a special wagon to Chatsworth. Um, there's a lovely description of how the gateways had to be dismantled and trees had to be sh 
uh, trimmed so they could fit it in. But there it is. Uh, it's probably well over 200 years old and is doing very nicely. Um, still in Derbyshire at Elverston, this remarkable weeping ash um, was top grafted at 80 feet. So it was once the, the main stem you see is a common ash and uh, because it's a sport it won't grow from seed. So uh, there it is, it was in Elvis and Henry's book. They describe how it was top grafted in the late 19th century. And we have another interesting tree which has actually uh, only recently disappeared uh, at Aberford in Yorkshire. And you can see how the weeping boughs of this were made into a bower. Um, and uh, very sadly that was lost only 20 years or so ago. Uh, we no longer know this tree. This was over in East Anglia in Norfolk. Um, look how this weeping ash again had been made into a beautiful bower. Um, and uh, this is a beautiful engraving from um, the Eastern Arboretum, which is a, a wonderful uh, 1841 book by Grigor, um, and he displays some of the most remarkable trees of Norfolk. While working on the book, my research has led me to Devon, to the estate at Heenton Satchville. Um, I'd seen reference in various books to uh, ash arbours being constructed in the early part of the 19th century. Um, uh, an idea that was proposed by uh, J.C. Loudon um, in his Arboretum et Fruticetum. And sure enough, here we are uh, on the estate, on the edge of the estate, the remains of an ash arbour. Um, this is getting on for 200 years old. Um, you can see how these young trees were pleached together and there they are still growing uh, 200 years on, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and uh, I, ash is incredibly biddable. You can um, really cut it and chop it about and in theory it will come back stronger than ever. Um, a lot of trees um, that were cut into pollards have obviously grown out over the years because nobody's cut them back. And this tree, you can see, is typical. You've got the low butt of the original pollard and then you've got uh, long stems uh, which are now becoming hazardous because if the wind catches them when they're in leaf, um, it can easily split the whole tree asunder. Um, Dave Smith, who's working on this, is erring on the side of caution um, and actually uh, doing what we call a crown reduction on it. So he's not taking it all the way back and he's leaving um, a little bit of live growth so that the tree can make some leaf and feed itself in the following year. Um, I've yet to go back and see how successful this was but I'm pretty sure that this tree will be doing very well. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting really because pollarding is something that we seldom do now. I mean it's really uh, mainly on estates uh, that uh, people are preserving the landscape character by pollarding their trees. Um, the National Trust uh, up in Cumbria in Borrowdale uh, looks after all its ash trees up there and um, is very keen to make sure that the landscape character is, uh, is kept in Borrowdale. So every 10 to 15 years they work their way around the trees um, making sure that they're all happy. As we know, ash is a superb timber and it's served man very, very well down the centuries. Um, I want to show you just a few of the things that uh, either have been or are still being made from ash. Uh, this, by the way, is Rob Penn. He's an author who a few years ago did a book called The Man Who Made Things Out of Trees. And he had a personal mission to select an ash tree and make, uh, he wanted to make as many different things from his ash tree as he possibly could. And in the end, he made 45 different things. Um, not personally, he had most of them made, although he made some of the smaller things himself, and uh, wrote a book all about it. Um, here are some of the small things that he made. Uh, he made it, had a gigantic table made, 
um, which he can't even fit in his house, but it's a very splendid and beautiful thing. Um, but it's a lovely project, and I do recommend his book if you want a fascinating read. Historically, um, it served the sports industries very well before we had all the uh, modern polycarbons and what have you. Uh, tennis rackets were made from ash. Uh, here we see them being made in the 1930s. Uh, snooker cues, billiard cues were turned from ash and uh, I believe some still are today. I think ash is still used by some of the players. Um, and uh, it was always used for making tools, uh, tool handles, particularly axe handles, because it absorbed stress so well. And again, stress was an important thing in the making of wheels. Um, and here uh, you see a wheel being made. These are what they call the fellies. It's spelled fellows. But this is the rim of the wheel, which has got to absorb all the shock of the rough roads. And uh, this is um, a lovely chap up in Lancashire called Phil Gregson, who uh, is one of only a handful of traditional wheelwrights left. Um, this is Mike Abbott, uh, a renowned green woodworker, um, busy at work on a uh, shaving horse, making the components for one of his famous ash chairs. Um, Mike uh, has been doing this for many, many years and runs courses as well. Here you can see him uh, busy putting one of his tr chairs together, uh, putting the spindles in. Um, they are truly beautiful things. If you get a chance to get hold of a, a Mike Abbott chair, you're a very lucky person. And um, something else that we um, all know, I'm sure, even this uh, shape of this frame will give it away, uh, this is the famous Morgan motor car, and you can see the frame here uh, being built in the works at Malvern. Uh, I asked the chap who was building it uh, how many of these uh, he uh, could make in a year, and uh, he thought it took him, uh, he could do about three, three and a half in a week. And uh, we worked out the time that he'd been uh, working uh, at the factory, he probably made something like um, two and a half, three thousand cars. So uh, you can see uh, how uh, how beautiful this is. Anyway, it's it's lovely to think of an old traditional method of building cars in this mass market world. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, um, something very very small. This was um, a piece of ash that came from a tree we felled in our ground, and a chap I knew turned this wonderful bowl for me. Uh, really a treasured possession. And Ash has uh, become famous in probably one of the most beautiful uh, landscape artworks uh, ever produced in this country. Uh, this is Ash Dome by David Nash and I'd long wanted to go and see it and being there and experiencing it was absolutely amazing. Um, it's as if you have disturbed a group of dancers frozen in time in this little woodland glade and um, it is really something to behold. I felt very lucky to be able to go and see this because uh, Nash has um, been very secretive about the location of this for years and years and years. He planted these trees in 1977 and uh, he hoped that they would outlive him um, but because they've now been touched by ash dieback that seems somewhat unlikely which is really sad because you know it's uh, it's lovely to think that something will live on after you. Um, he's planted oak trees around the outside of them now whether they will be as biddable as his ash trees have been um, it remains to be seen really, but uh, it is a splendid thing. Um, it's interesting to know that some people have searched for years and years and years trying to find this without success. So I felt particularly privileged to be able to be taken there to see it. Um, I'll just show you a few remarkable trees before we finish. How about this one? This looks to be, have been laid along a wall. It's in an old green lane up above the Usk Valley in Wales. Um, it's a sort of 40-50 feet long 
uh, a really quite amazing thing. And how about this for tenacity? This is in Wharfdale in Yorkshire, a tree growing from the top of a boulder. Again, we would have to hope that this one will actually survive because it is so unusual. And ash also sometimes pays host to um, uh, cuckoo trees that grow in it or on it. And in this case, this is back in Borrowdale again, where we started at the beginning of the show, a rowan growing out of the top of this ash tree. Who's going to survive? And what this is about, I have no idea. A strange phenomenon in Elvis and Henry's Edwardian book about trees. Um, but my own personal uh, favourite was this beautiful ash mask, a huge bird that grew on a woodland tree not far from where I live. Sadly, I have to say, this was cut down by foresters this year. Um, I was really upset. It was a felt like a real loss. So here we are. This is the end of the show. Um, this is me, <laughs> obviously, um, standing with um, an absolutely huge uh, ash tree, which is some uh, 29, 30 feet around uh, at a site called Mockus Park, which is, is in Herefordshire, but it's not actually uh, open to the public. It's an old deer park famed for its uh, oak trees. Um, but I have to say, this is absolutely my favourite tree. Um, you won't see many uh, like this, that's for sure. And how is it formed like this? How old is it? I'm willing to believe that this could be well in excess of 300 years old. So there we are, really. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, my brief tour through the ash and uh, what it means in this country. Um, we haven't touched on some subjects. Uh, I didn't really show you anything to, or tell you anything to do with the numerous uh, aspects of folklore um, that the ash has spawned. Um, there's ash in um, literature, there's ash poetry, um, there is uh, ash place names, which is again, you know, very important. It crops up all over the place. Um, and uh, so I think all I can really say to you is uh, if you want to know more, uh, here we come with the plug. If you want to know more, you could do no worse than buy yourself uh, a copy of Ash. And uh, of course, if you do want one, I'll be happy to sign it for you. And uh, thank you for watching this and uh, enjoying it. And keep your eye on ash trees and also keep your fingers crossed because, um, as I said at the beginning, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we do have people who are out there trying their damnedest to um, come up with uh, ash dieback tolerant trees that might survive, that might keep them going and um, with any luck, uh, 20 years down the road, I want to be proved wrong. Um, it's all very well me saying that we might lose 99% of our ash trees, uh, which we might, but uh, if we can manage to keep some of them going then it will be a wonderful thing. And I think like all things, um, it may well be that ash dieback is part of the natural cycle. One day we'll see big elms again and one day we'll see big ash again, I'm sure. Thanks a lot. <laughs>